achieved. So today, uh, I want to talk to some people that are tired. I mean, I don't know about you, uh, but in the middle of this COVID season, in the midst of, of things not quite being right, it seems like, like sometimes I can just feel like I'm exhausted, you know? And it, sometimes I don't, it's not even that I'm doing more. Sometimes I could be doing less, but it, but it feels like it's more draining. And they, they actually have a thing scientifically that, that they call COVID-19 brain, that because of the crisis that is going on in our world and, and our constant bombardment with, with not quite being normal and not quite being in the regular groove of things, it's like, it's like our brain is, is steadily trying to figure out what's going on. And so sometimes it can be hard hard to remember something you know like it's like they, they call it tip of the tongue syndrome like you like it's like right there and you're like well what what is it again or or sometimes it can be hard to focus or you know it can, it can be hard to really just like like just just to be present in your mind because it's like your mind is constantly trying to figure out like where am I and, and what's normal and what are we doing here and and how do we how do we survive this moment and it's it reminds me of what it's like to travel. Uh, anybody ever flown on a plane? I'm not, I'm not asking if you're going to fly anytime soon, but, but have you ever flown? And it's funny because if you fly, you're not really doing anything but sitting down, right? Like I'm sitting down, uh, eating my peanuts. Now they did away with peanuts because everybody's allergic. And I'm like, dang, all, all I want is some peanuts. That's all I want right now. Two free things, pretzels and peanuts. Can I just get some peanuts, please? But no, no more peanuts, right? So you're trying to make the little pretzels last. And you're just, you're just sitting on the plane. But have you ever noticed that when you get to your destination, you feel exhausted? And, and part of the reason why that is, is because in the midst of your plane ride, there is the constant humming noise of the plane, that, that noise that's there, that's constantly there. And even though you're not necessarily paying attention to it, your brain is consistently trying to process that noise. So at the end of the flight, you felt like you were the one flying the plane and all you were doing is sitting in coach. And so I, I, what I wonder is, is, is there anyone else that has, that's kind of like me, like there's been a buzz of what's going on in our nation, a, a buzz of the politics and political unrest, a buzz of the riots and, and the police officers and now federal officers and, 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 and actual war gear coming in our cities, the, the buzz of some of the greatest leaders of our civil rights movement movement that are passing away, the buzz of police brutality, the buzz of the fact that we need the police anyway and the juxtaposition between the different political positions, the buzz of COVID-19 and the numbers steadily rising of people who are catching it and people who are dying and the buzz of the grief because some of the people that we love have passed away, the buzz and, and, and it might not be something that we're cognizant of on the surface, but our mind, our being is consistently processing it and it can leave you tired. Sometimes when I'm really tired, I'm just like, I'm, I'm tired red. Like I'm so tired, it has to have like another syllable to it. I'm, I'm tired red. I, I, I am, I'm exhausted. Have you? Have you ever just been exhausted? I remember after I took the Texas bar exam, which was a two and a half day test that I had studied for for like two and a half months. And I was so stressed out that, that after the test was done, now mind you, I'm just sitting there with a computer, uh, sitting there with a little pencil and a little Scantron. But after the test was done, I literally felt sore to the touch. like. Like as though I had been through a wrestling match and I felt like the most exhausted, like, like I felt like I couldn't even carry myself. You know what I'm talking about? But I wonder, is there anyone under the sound of, the, of my voice that feels like they've gotten to a place where they cannot even carry themselves anymore? Because 
you, you've gone through and you're trying to be a mother and you, you keep trying to do the right thing and you're working at the same time and, and now there's a question of whether or not your kids are going to go back to school and you're trying to figure out, I don't know how I'm going to be able to do this because I, I'm tired. Well, there could be there could be a father that that is working hard and doing his best to provide for his children. And the next thing you know, because of covid, there there were furloughs and and now you were furloughed and you're trying to figure out how am I going to make ends meet when I don't even have enough energy and I don't even have enough education and I don't even have enough whatever it is that you can fill in the blank and you're trying to figure out how you can do things and as you try to figure these things out you are com constantly in a state of fatigue there might be somebody that's single and and in the midst of this COVID season it feels like it has exacerbated your loneliness and, and all of a sudden you feel like there's nobody there with you and and it's like you're still going to work and you're coming home and you can't hang out and you're all by yourself and you're just like you know I'm just I'm just I'm just tired. Well, one of the things that I love about the scripture, and I, I believe that it speaks and attests to the truth therein, is that the heroes in the Bible are not perfect. And the heroes in the Bible, we can see them going through some of the very same ebbs and flows of life that we go through. And so I want to talk about Elijah and a period of time where he was extremely exhausted. What's interesting is when you're reading the Bible, it can be just a number of chapters and a number of chapters can represent a year or several years. And so we first see Elijah come on the scene in scripture in 1 Kings 17. In 1 Kings 17, the very first words that we hear Elijah utter is to the king and he st boldly steps up in the face of the king who could kill him, mind you, who could be like off with his head. He goes in front of the king and he tells the king, because you have not been obedient to God and all that God is calling you to do and you've served other gods, until I say so, it's not going to rain. And he's like, don't believe me, just watch, right? And then it's like, ding, 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 and then he, and then he left. So after you could imagine, after he said something like that and he does something like that, he is running for his life. So he begins his, his ministry running for his life. And the scripture talks about like, like, so he goes from in the king's presence to he goes into a place where there is a brook where the Holy Spirit leads him. And because there is a drought and because the king would want him to, to be executed, he is hiding in the wilderness. But God has provided a brook for him to have fresh spring water. And he's provided for him a raven that brings both bread and meat in the morning and the evening. It is amazing that God can provide for us in the most innovative ways that we don't have to depend and rely on the world's system of doing things because God has the ability to provide for you in a way that your eye has not seen that your that your ear hasn't heard that you have not even imagined yet so for everybody that's wondering and struggling and trying to figure out I don't know how I'm going to make ends meet I don't know how I'm going to make sure that my kids eat I don't know how I'm going to sustain my business I don't know how can I tell you you don't have to know how because God can make a way out of absolutely no way. He can come up with a how where there would be none in our own mind because it's, it's miraculous provision. But because of the drought that Elijah prophesied, there came a point at which the very brook upon which he relied dried up. And when the brook dried up, the Holy Spirit, the word came to Elijah, you need to go to a widow's house. Now, it's crazy because the last thing you think when you need something is let me go to the person that's struggling the most and they're going to be able to provide for me. But God told him, go to the widow's house, not because the widow had enough, but because he wanted to bless the widow with more than enough. And so I preached about this a, a few months ago, but where the widow 
essentially gives Elijah her first of the little bit of water and a little bit of a cake that she made of, of oil and flour and per the prophecy that Elijah spoke to her for the entirety of the drought and the famine. She never ran out of flour. She never ran out of oil and she always had enough. Some of you might have remembered the shirts that the choir wore, never not enough, never not enough. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter what it seems like. God has the ability to take what you have and to multiply it. If you seek him first, he can take you from never enough to never not enough. And Elijah was a partaker of that bread. But, but then there came a time when Elijah had to, had to call off. It was time again for, for him to call off the drought and for, it, for there to be rain. And so he has to go again and he has to confront the king. And so he does all this. And I don't want to get caught up. But I just want you to see that, that just the whole beginning of Elijah's ministry, he was running for his life. He was, he was trying to figure out how he was going to make it. And God always provided for him. But I'm sure that you could imagine that was a lonely existence. And so we see when Elijah then confronts the king, this is where if you're a Bible scholar, you already know the story where he prays and fire comes down from heaven and supernaturally takes up the sacrifice. And he by himself kills 450 false prophets. And when he does this, the queen has a problem with it because they were the prophets of her God. And she says to Elijah, Elijah, she, and now, now, now back then they didn't have text messages, so, but they sent a message. And the message that she sent said, may God do the same thing to me as you've done to all of these others. But if I have not done to you what you did to them by this time tomorrow. And so you can imagine, it, it might be one thing if, if he heard that at the beginning and he felt fresh and he felt new and he felt like everything was going to be okay. But he heard this, it was about three and a half years of being isolated and three and a half years of, of walking according to the calling of God that had him in the wilderness and three and a half years that had him, him with, a, with a widow and three and a half years that had him with the ravens and now for him to do all that he did can you imagine the strength and the energy that it must have taken for him to even have that victory and I don't know about you but but have you ever ever had a time where you were tired not because you were losing but you were tired even while you were winning I'm, I'm talking about like you're doing the right thing and you're saying the right thing and God is blessing, but simultaneously you don't know how you can go on because it took everything that you had to just get over the last thing. And this is where Elijah was. And I want to pick that up in scripture in 1 Kings chapter 19. He came on the scene in chapter 17. Now it's only chapter 19. And this is how exhausted Elijah is is. He said this in the word, it says, Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed. Now listen to this prayer. We would think that the, the prophet, the man of God, would pray something like, God, take care of my enemies, or, or, you know, Father, strengthen me now that I can go the rest of the way. No, 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 no. Listen, listen to Elijah's prayer. He prayed that he might die. And this is what he said. I have had enough. I've had enough. I've had enough, Lord. Somebody, is, somebody has been in a, a rough relationship and you feel like you're at the end of what it is that you have to offer and you're like, God, I, I've had enough. Somebody has been raising a child that has consistently gotten into trouble and, and, and they, they, they might be in, in jail right now. And you're like, God, God, help me, Father. I've had enough. I don't know what your circumstance is, but Elijah said, I have had enough, Lord. He said, and this is a prayer, y'all. He said, take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. 
I wonder, has anyone under the sound of my voice ever felt like because of what you are going through and because of the struggle <clears throat> being so real that you're just like, you know what, God? I don't want to live like this. Like, like the, the way that I've been living is not sustainable and the things that, that have been occurring to me, I don't see how I'm going to make it out of this. So, Father, I'm just, I'm just asking you, just please, like if, if I close my eyes and I don't wake up tomorrow, I'm going to be all right. This is the prayer that one of the greatest prophets we see in Scripture was praying. And I, I, I just want to say this. Aren't you glad that, that, that God doesn't answer some of our prayers? Have you ever prayed a prayer that when you look back on, you like, ooh, thank God. <laughs> if, I, if, I, if you would have answered that prayer, I would have been married to him. My life would have been all messed up. Thank you, Jesus, <clears throat> that you didn't answer that prayer. I'm just saying, like, like, have you ever prayed a prayer that if God had answered, it would have changed your entire life? So he prayed a prayer asking God, just let me die. But this is what I want you to see. Two things. He was in the middle of the wilderness and in the middle of this desert, deserted place, there was one solitary tree from which he was able to find shade. And it doesn't matter what it looks like or what it seems like. It can feel like there's absolutely nothing for me here and there's no way that I'm going to make it. And you will find a single solitary tree from which you can take shade. And that shade can be just enough for God to speak to you. But we see here that, that, that what he did was he prayed the prayer and he didn't even have the energy to, to engage with God. He just prayed the prayer and he went to sleep. And as he slept, as he rested, an angel tapped him and woke him up and he said, you need to eat and you need to drink. And so he got up and there was fresh baked bread and there was water and he ate the, the bread and he drank some water. But you know how it is when you don't really feel your best and your, your appetite's not quite there. So, so he ate a little bit and he, he went back to sleep. And then the angel tapped him again and, and he woke up and when the angel tapped him, the angel said, you need to continue to eat. You need to eat some more because if you do not eat, then the journey ahead is going to be too much for you. And so he ate some more. He ate the rest of the bread and he, and he drank again. And this is what I just want to say. I want to posit to you that sometimes when you're just feeling exhausted and when you feel like you can't go on and you're fatigued, the very first thing you need to do is you need to take care of your physical body. If you've ever talked to First Lady, sometimes she'll say this. She'll say, sometimes the most spiritual thing that you can do is to take a nap. Because when you're exhausted and you're tired and you have not eaten properly, the, the only way that we can interact with this world is through this earth suit that we have, which is our body. So when our body is not well, then our interaction with the world cannot be as well as the otherwise should be. And so sometimes if you really want to feel better, the very first thing that you have to do is to start taking care of yourself. So Elijah rested. Elijah, he ate properly. Elijah hydrated. We already saw even in his journey, he was exercising. So, so as he began to take care of himself, as he began to get the proper rest, and as he began to eat, and as he began to nourish himself, now he had enough energy to go forward in his journey. And so what he did was he began a journey towards wholeness. But it began by seeking God. So first, first you're taking care of your physical body. And when he had enough strength in his physical man, then he went 40 days and 40 nights to the mountain of God where he met with God himself. So he began this journey from, from being having suicidal ideations and, and, and being depressed. He began this journey towards wholeness and he started at the mountain of God. That's like saying he came to church or that's like saying he fell down on his knees and, and he went to where he knew that God would be. And... When he got there, he heard a question from God. But first, once he got where he was going, what did he do again? 
he, he rested. He, he fell asleep. And, and after he fell asleep, I'm sure that God allowed him time to give him rest because then God spoke to him and, and awoke him out of his sleep. God spoke to him and said, what are you doing here? And that's where we see the motivation behind Elijah feeling the worst he's ever felt in his life. That's where we see him say and pray a prayer. He said, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty. Meaning I've done everything that I could do. I, I tried my hardest. I've given everything that I've got. I did everything that I can. But the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. What was he saying? He was saying, God, I am exhausted. God, I feel all alone. God... I can't live like this. And I don't know if anybody's ever prayed a prayer like that to just say, God, I, I can't keep doing this the way I've been doing this. I, that this is going to kill me. They're, they're trying to kill me on my job. They, they're trying to kill me. This marriage is trying, this, this situation, it seems like it's trying to crush me. And so God said, he said, stand before me at the face of the mountain. And when he did that, the, the, the scripture says that the actual presence, like the manifest presence of God passed by. And when the manifest presence of God passed by, I don't know if it's like some superhero type stuff where because God is so enormous and, and, and he cannot be contained that all of nature actually had to be shaken in its, in his wake. And so what occurred is when God passed by, Elijah there, the next thing you know, we have a windstorm. And when I'm talking about y'all, y'all, we were in El Paso, and if you're far east or far west or northeast, y'all know the wind can be crazy. But this kind of wind was so significant that it was literally blowing down huge pieces of the mountain. The rock was breaking up because the wind was so strong, and it was a torrential wind. And can you imagine being in that kind of a wind? And you're like, I already said God killed me. This must be how I'm going right? The wind is blowing. Next thing you know, the wind stops blowing and it's like, okay, well, well, I'm still here. And then when the wind stops blowing, all of a sudden the earth starts shaking. There is an earthquake, a massive earthquake. And now whatever the wind was not able to blow away, now the very earth is shaking loose. But the Bible says that God was not in the wind. And it says again that God was not in the earthquake. So you would think, oh my God, this is the worst time of my life. Not only is, is Jezebel trying to kill me and I'm all alone and I'm praying to die, but I'm still here. I survived the wind. I survived the earthquake. Then the scripture says there was fire. And the fire, I believe, was burning up all of the chaff and all of the things that were all around him, but it did not touch Elijah. And I think that's kind of where they got the name Earth, Wind, and Fire from. I don't know. But anyway, so there was a windstorm, there was an earthquake, and there was a fire, but the scripture says that God was not in the fire. So what happened? Elijah had to press past the distraction of the wind, the distraction of the earth shaking, the distraction of the fire. He had to press past the distraction of CNN and Fox News, the distraction of what's going on in politics today, the distraction of the civil unrest, the distraction of his own worries and fears about what was going on in his life. And after all of that, that's when we hear that he heard what the King James Version calls a still small voice. In, in the New Living Translation, it, it, it talks about there being whispers, a, a, a gentle whisper. And so what Elijah had to do was he had to summon the, the ability to believe in God enough to press past all of the distraction in his world, all of the distraction in his mind, everything that was going on in the earth realm, enough to lean in to the whisper. 
And so the scripture tells us that as he stood, he, he heard the whisper that he went out into the face of the cave and he, he wrapped his face in a cloak because he wanted to just hear what God has to say. And interestingly enough, what God did was he asked him the same question that he asked him in the beginning, Elijah, what are you doing here? And I know whenever God asks a question, it's not because he really has a question that he does not know the answer to. God always asks a question because he wants to engage us, because he wants to be in a relationship with us, because he wants us to talk to him. And once again, Elijah prayed the prayer. He said, God, I am exhausted. I've done my best, but I feel all alone, and I cannot live like this. And here's what's interesting. God responds in a whisper. He says this. Then the Lord told him, go back the same way you came and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Haziel to be king of Aram. Then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimshi, to be king of Israel. And anoint Elijah, son of Shaphat, from the town of abel Mahola, to replace you as my prophet. Anyone who escapes Haziel will be killed by Jehu. And those who escape Jehu will be killed by Elisha. Yet I, yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have not bowed down to Baal or kissed him. And for years, I read this scripture. And for years, I'm like, God, how does this help? Like, like, like seriously, like, like Elijah just told you, I'm exhausted. I, I feel alone. I, I can't live like this. And it seemed like what God did was give him more work to do. But I believe that in my spirit that God dropped revelation this week. I have not heard anyone preach this. I ain't get this from any, any place but God. I believe that there's, there's a multiplicity of things that's going on. On the surface, what God was doing was renewing his purpose. He was saying, here is an assignment. Go do the things that I've called you to do. He was renewing his motivation because he was telling him there is still an enemy to defeat. But this is what else God was doing. He was renewing his purpose, renewing his motivation. He also gave Elijah community because he was saying these kings and this, and this future prophet, these are the people that are going to help you along the battle. So he gave him the community, a strategic partnership to let him know that he wasn't alone. That's on the surface. And I think that that's good all by, him, by itself. I'm going to say it one more time. He renewed his purpose. He renewed his motivation and he gave him community. He placed him in community. That's why we come to church. Even when we can't come to church, that's why we are a part of the church because a part of our purpose is something that cannot be carried out alone. I mean, you can do it for a little while all by yourself, but if you keep going down that path, there's only a certain point from which, at which point you'll be completely and totally exhausted and you'll want to end. But if you want to keep it up and you want to go the long haul and you want to stay in the race, which is not given to the swift nor to the strong, but to the one that endures to the end, if you want to be able to hold on and endure, then you need to be a part of a community that's on the surface but when you look deeper every name that Elijah was told to anoint was a message from God all by itself and I know you're like Karen what are you, what are you talking about well the first person that God told Elijah to anoint was Haziel and when you look up the meaning of Hazael, it actually means God has seen. So when he was saying, the very the first thing I want you to know is that I have seen your struggle. I have seen your trouble. I know the hurt that you're going through. I know the pain that you're trying to press through. I understand that you feel like you can't make it anymore. I have seen everything 
every tear that you've cried. I've seen everything that you've regretted. I've seen every piece of something that's inside of you that makes you feel like I, I wish I hadn't lived that way and I, I wish I hadn't done that and I wish I would have made a better decision and I wish I would have done something differently. God has seen every single one of those things. There's not a tear you've cried. There's not a thought that you have derived. There is nothing that has gone on in your life that has gone past the watchful eye of God. God has seen. The next name that God told him to anoint was Jehu. <clears throat> and the name Jehu means God is he. So number one, God has seen. That means that he's been there all along, that you have never been alone, that he will never leave you, that he will never forsake you, that he's always by your side. God has seen. Then God is he. What does it mean to say that God is he? It means that you are not God. Uh-oh. That means this is, it should be a relief. And I know that it's hard because you're not in control of every situation and you can't dictate how people act and what things happen to you. But because you're not God, the good thing is you don't have to carry the weight of the entire world. You don't, you don't have to try to do this by yourself because God has seen, meaning he's been there all the time. And then God is he, meaning he's the one that's going to do the work that he, and complete the work that he began in you. He's the one that's going to take you through this situation like he took you through the last one. He's the one that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the one. So let God be God. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say it one more time. Let God be God. Because when we try to be God, it only makes us exhausted. It only makes us tired. It only makes us feel like giving up. Because we don't have what it takes. We don't know enough. We haven't been through enough. We don't have enough power. But I dare you to let the almighty God be God in your life over everything situation over the broken places of your life over your hurt over your shame over your disappointment let God be he but here's 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 another thing about the idea that it's Jehu God is he the other interpretation for God is Yah as in Yahweh is he Yahweh it's the name that God gave Moses when he said who should I say sent me and God told him I am that I am tell them Yahweh the God of your your fathers the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob he is the one that sent you and so when he said God is he he is affirming that the I am that I am is he I am meaning to be he, he God does not just exist God is existence and it is that same God that existed before the heavens and the earth the same God that existed before the sun and the moon the same God that that one that spoke let there be light and there was light it's this same God that is here with you so so God has seen God is he and then he told him I want you to go ahead and replace I want you to go ahead and anoint your successor the one that's going to replace you and he's so okay Elisha Elisha it sounds close to Elijah but the meanings are completely different because when you look up the meaning of the name Elisha you see that it means God is salvation so God has seen there's been nothing that I've gone through, nothing that you've gone through that has escaped his knowledge. God has not forgotten about you. Jehu is, God is he, Yah is he. He is the great I am. That is the God that is standing with you. And I love this last one, God is salvation. That means that he's coming to our rescue. 
He's the one that is going to save us from all of our trouble. He is the one that is going to save us from our sickness. He is the one that is going to help us. Now let me tell you, it might take a fight. You might have to fight to do it, but God is going to be there fighting for you. He's going to be there fighting with you. And can I tell you that God has never lost a fight. So the God that has begun the universe, he sees you. That same God that is the great I am, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that God is with you. And that God will be your salvation. But you have to, you, 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 sometimes it's not enough to just hear a preacher say that to you. Sometimes, sometimes it's not enough just to hear it, hear it coming out of my mouth. Sometimes you have to lean in to the whisper. And I just wonder, is there anyone that's here today, even, even online, that, that might need to hear from God himself? Here's, here's the thing about a whisper. A whisper requires relationship. Strangers just don't come up to you and start whispering. I'm going to whisper a secret that I don't want someone else to hear because I want it. It's just for you. And God wants to whisper to you today. Uh, in order for there to be a whisper, there has to be a relationship. There has to be intimacy. There has to be closeness. And God wants you to come close to him today so that he can whisper to you. He wants to, to give you whispers of life. Whispers of peace. He wants to tell you that everything is going to be all right. He wants to tell you that he still has a plan for your life and that your mistakes did not change that. He wants to tell you that he's been there all along and he will not stop being there for you. He wants to tell you that eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those of you who love him, what God has prepared for you. He wants to whisper his love. Oh, y'all thought, y'all thought I forgot the, the series that we're in is love over everything. And God wants to whisper his love to his people. If, if I were to, to have a, a topic besides sick and tired, then, then the topic would be sustained by his love because he wants to draw you near and he wants to whisper life. I don't know what you need. I don't know what, what has you tired. And I, I don't know what you feel like is the thing that is threatening your very existence. But I, one thing I do know is that God has seen that God is he. He is the I am that I am. And that God is your salvation. I want to pray. I want to pray for somebody who feels like they need to be rescued. This, this moment is sacred. And so I just invite you to just do your best to try to just push past distraction, the distraction of the, the, being in your kitchen or your kids or whomever or whatever is going on. And I dare you to just focus right now and to lean into the whispers. Father, we bless you right now. We recognize that there are things that we need for life that we can get from no other place than but from you. Father, we repent. I repent of allowing the noise of busyness, the noise of trying to figure things out, the noise of Netflix, and the noise of the news noise of politics and all of these things the noise of my own pain being, being agents that prevent me from hearing you whisper being agents that prevent us from leaning in to hear you speak a word just to us 
A word that no one else can hear and no one else knows. A word that we didn't get from a book, but a word that was fresh and spoken from the heart of God right to our spirit. So Father, I pray that you open up our hearts, that you open up our minds, that you quiet the buzz of the world. And that you whisper sweet nothing in our ear. I know that nothing you ever say could be nothing, but you, I believe that you want to whisper love and encouragement to us. And so, Father, right now we lean in like Elijah. We, we stop the distraction. We focus on We ask that you speak because we need you. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, wherever you are, if it's safe, I invite you just to throw your hands up and as a sign of surrender to say, God, I, I give up trying to do it my own way and I give up trying trying to do it of my own strength and I try to giving up trying to trying to make people do what I want them to do God I, I'm giving up trying to force something to happen that it seems like I can't make happen I'm giving that up so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna be quiet for a moment and I'm gonna believe that God is whispering I know it's hard. I know. I know we live in a world that cherishes busyness. But I dare you just to come on. Just let's just let's just give them two minutes of just. this check put your put your confidence in me and watch me give you everything that you need that you did not even know that you needed it that you would not even even known to ask for watch me do it allow me to give you brand new life a refreshing Come on, I speak a refreshing right now over everyone under the sound of my voice. I speak of refreshing, a brand new sense of purpose, a brand new sense of expectation, a brand new sense of why you need to get up, a brand new sense of your motivation. I speak a revival in your spirit right now, and I speak a community. I speak life that only community can bring. Father, I pray that even now, even though we're not gathering, in the same space at the same time that they feel the power of community as never before hallelujah there's someone in this place you're listening to me and, and you have not yet accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior 
Can I tell you that that is the very beginning of establishing your relationship? I know if you're listening right now, I know that you've already heard from God. I know that he has already whispered to you. And, and I want you to, in response to his whisper, I just want you to say, you know what? I believe you. And the way that we say, I believe you, is to accept him as our savior, as our rescuer, as the one that's going to bring us out. So if you need to choose Jesus for the first time, or you need to come back home, just pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, I believe that you love me so much that you sent your son Jesus to die for my sin. And he rose again so that I can have eternal life. Come into my heart. Let me hear everything that you have to whisper. And lead me into an abundant life through Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Glory to God. If you made that decision, it is literally the best thing you could have done this week. The absolute best way you could start your week. And I'm just going to declare this. The rest of your life will be the best of your life because Jesus breaks all of the difference. So if you made that choice, we'd love to hear from you. Hit us up on Facebook. Email us at info at destiny, the number for me.com. Or you could even call us 915-755-7744. We have a gift we'd like to send you. We don't want to stop you we don't want to harass you we just want you to have a community so that you can have the strength to continue on in your journey we love you i hope you were blessed by this